amazing guest for you today. Actually, it was a guest that you guys not only requested, but you were pretty adamant. You insisted. And, and, and he hadn't come on and you guys started writing him. So there was really no choice in this matter. You know, I started this broadcast on March 20th, really when Sheltering in Place started just to create a sense of community and connection. But so many people tuned in, which I'm so appreciative of. And so many wonderful guests wanted to be on the show. And this was like the top request. Have this guy, have this guy. And I said he was really busy. And then you guys kept bombarding him with email. So what choice did he have but to be here? He is the medical director of the McDougal program. That's why I'm worried. Yeah, I always try to have my shirt match the guest. His name is Dr. Anthony Lim. And I'm so excited because I really have never interviewed him before. So welcome, Dr. Lim. Thank you for taking the time to talk to everyone today. Thanks, AJ. It's great to see you. It's great to be here. I'm wearing my uh, broccoli shirt that a patient at True North uh, kindly uh, gave me. So I have one broccoli and one spinach. So today's broccoli. I love it. You know, I, I my brothers are both doctors, lots of cousins, and I I didn't want to be a medical doctor. I actually wanted to be a veterinarian, but I always thought if I was going to be a doctor, I would probably be an endocrinologist because I don't really like cutting people up and things. But if I was a doctor, I'd want to be you because you have not only the best job in the world, but the three best jobs in the world. I mean, <laughs> it's like a trifecta. You work, I mean, all the people that I admire most in the plant-based world, you work with them, for them, or have. And then the thing you do at Kaiser, I mean, you really are the luckiest doctor alive. I feel every day I wake up, I feel extremely blessed and fortunate. So yes, I, I, I'm, I'm incredibly lucky. Yeah. So I just, I, is there, is there a difference between the kind of patients you saw at True North and the kind of patients that you saw at the McDougal program, or was there a little bit of overlap? Or? Definitely overlap. I mean, in fact, a lot of people uh, who have attended a 10 day McDougal program uh, go on to it. Um, spend some time at True North. Uh, there's a lot of crossover and I really view them as synergistic. Um, you know, there's far more that True North and, and the McDougal program share in common than different. I mean, they do have their, their differences and, and so people will benefit from that. But um, I, I view the two programs as synergistic. And as Dr. McDougal likes to joke, if, if any patient uh, fails, his program, then he will, he will uh, boot them over to True North. <laughs> That's hilarious. It's sort of like the McDougal program is just regular prison, but True North <laughs> is solitary confinement. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, it's, uh, because you know Goldhammer's the warden. There's a question if the 10-day program will open up again, Sharon asks. Yeah, uh, we absolutely intend to do so. Uh, so we ha uh, had to uh, cancel the uh, most recent June program, of course, because of the COVID and um, social distancing and, and really wanting to take the safety of our patients as our um, top priority. But uh, we're hoping come fall that we can uh, start to um, have the 10-day programs. It might be modified. You know, we may not be able to have as many people participating. Um, but uh, that's, you know, we're just literally taking it one month at a time. Uh, in the meantime, though, we are working on uh, coming out with some online uh, offerings to uh, adapt to this new climate uh, that we that we're in. Yeah, it was so great. Dr. McDougall offered all his paid programs, not the, not the 10 day, obviously, but the ones, you know, the Stark solution and all these courses online for free for people to really take control of their health destiny during this sheltering. Yeah, absolutely. This uh, very generous, you know, it's, it's really unbelievable that the decades of work uh, and articles and everything, recipes that Dr. McDougall and Mary McDougall have um, co-written and, and come up with together is all online made available free to, uh, to individuals. And um, it's one of the reasons I love being a part of the McDougall program. It's, it's just a great team to be to be working with. Yeah. Isn't it fun though that wherever you work in Santa Rosa, you get the best food. You don't even have to make it. <laughs> I know I've got a lot of options available to me. Oh, you know, so, that, you know with this uh, shelter in place, I've been, um, I started gardening. So for, I made my first, uh, did my first effort at gardening ever. Um, cause I finally had a little bit more time. And, uh, so the other day I ate two pounds zucchini. It was literally this big. Um, so I've been eating zucchini and squash and got some tomatoes, that are going to be ripening soon. Persian cucumber, lemon cucumber. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I'm, I, I, now that I've been introduced to the gardening world, there's no, there's no going back. Uh, 
it's amazing to just plant a seed and then see a couple months later, you know, the, 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 the fruit of, of one's labor. That's great. And I love hearing, we love hearing what our wonderful doctors like to do in their spare time. Like Dr. Furman said the same thing. He, you know, he has a big garden in his place. Does he? Yeah, no that. doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I know you, you probably can't answer this question to Esther watching live, but Esther's a former guest on the show and she wants to send you her book. I don't think you can actually give us your address, but I bet maybe there's a PO box or something she could send. Oh, it yeah. To. It, uh, uh, thank you, Esther. <laughs> so nice of you. Um, so you could just send it to True North, 1551 Pacific Avenue, San Great. Rosa, California, and, and, and I can pick it up there. That's terrific. So um, any, Renee says, any, any idea when you guys will reopen? Uh, our hope would be um, fall, uh, but we, I think it's, um, Things are changing so quickly. I mean, I just read, uh, I was just looking at the headlines today that, you know, it's the third highest um, number of cases uh, today. Uh, I think over 30,000 new cases in the U.S. Um, so this reopening, I don't think is quite working out how we're hoping. <laughs> and in fact, I just saw that a lot of states are kind of reversing. Counties and states are reversing. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I'm not... My philosophy, and this is actually one of my philosophies in life, I don't like to spend time thinking about things that, I, that are beyond my control. So I wanna think about it when it's relevant. Right now, this is our hope but, uh, that we'll open the fall, but it's hard to say, so I don't spend any time thinking about it. In the meantime, we're working on uh, online offerings. We're gonna be starting um, more telephone video consultations. Um, so we're, you know, I, I found that you can actually accomplish a huge amount of counseling and behavioral change uh, online, which is the you know beautiful, beautiful thing about Zoom and, and these new technologies that we have. I, I agree. And, and while I know there's a lot of extroverts out there that can't get way to back to business as usual, I love this option of online. And I think it's still going to be a good option even when things get back to normal, if there's such a thing, because yeah. I, I love, I love, I love communicating like this. So I love the idea of not worrying about things you can't do anything about. But what cracks me up is I really don't, I haven't like reentered society other than I do go to the grocery store once a week as I have throughout this thing. And, you know, I don't want to get into whether we need masks or not, but it, the people like they wear them on their chin. You know what I mean? Well, <laughs> if you're going to wear a mask, you wear a mask. It's, it doesn't, do anything when you, you know, you know what I'm talking about, yes, right? Or yeah. hanging on your ear. It's yeah. like, you know, that's like, uh, it's that, that to me is crazy. So I we know. have some very nice compliments. Jen says, this man has a beautiful voice. And I agree when you do write your book, I think you should be the audible reader because you do have a, Oh reader. yeah. If, I always, I always wondered about that. If I, if, and when I write a book I, or if it went on audible, I, I don't know. I always thought, why doesn't the author read it? <laughs> You know, I can tell you why, because, you know, I've done, I've written two books and I did my own audible and I actually had the privilege of being the voice actor for the pleasure trap. I think it's because a lot of times they don't have the time, especially if they're doctors and, you know, because it does, it's a lot of work. You go into a recording studio with a director and it, it takes an extraordinary amount of time. It's like, sometimes you'll have to do like 50 takes just to get one word, right? The pleasure trap was a really hard book to read because a lot of the words we didn't even know how to pronounce. So, but it is fun. You can do it yourself. Absolutely. Well, I can help you. I know all the directors and all the studios. It's, it's a well, very fun thing. I'll make a commitment right here, right now that if one day, God willing, I, I write a book, uh, my every intention would be to read it myself. And if it takes a lot of time, then that's just the time I need to take out of my schedule um, to, 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 to do it right. <laughs> I think nobody knows your book better than you. I think it would have been great if both uh, Goldhammer and Lyle read their book. I thought that that would have been fantastic, but they're in different cities and yeah. you know, that's how it is. Let's right. see. Um, well, the AJ, maybe what I'll do is um, so, I'd love to kind of hear some questions, but uh, as I told you, I thought I would share with um, your listeners just kind of some of the thoughts and things I've been hearing from patients and, and uh, perhaps some suggestions and ideas. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Take it away. Great. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted this to just kind of be an informal thing. I have no PowerPoint, no slides. When I was prepping for this yesterday, it was basically like, scratch notes and um but the theme that kind of came up for me it really was one word as i was thinking about today um and what i wanted to talk with you all about um 
And that word is discontent, uh, discontent. Um, and I'm seeing discontentment in, in many ways. Um, you know, on a societal level, uh, during this COVID period, there, there are quite a number of disturbing trends that we're seeing. Um, you know, many of you have heard of the COVID-15, <laughs> uh, right? And so people have, with a shelter in place, they've been at home more. Um, there's uh, understandably uh, stress levels are higher. And one of the things that people are turning to is food. So they're not just, they're not only eating more food, but they're eating um, less healthy food. And as a result, uh, they're putting, uh, they're putting on weight, you know, so you've got the COVID-15 and that's especially concerning because we, you know, we live in a country where it's not a, it's not a fact to be proud of, but seven out of 10 adults are overweight or obese. And um, so when we're adding on weight on top of that, we're only increasing our risk of um, complications should someone come down with uh, COVID. And there have been more and more studies come out uh, really linking obesity with a major risk factor for COVID complications. So that's one trend. But, uh, you know, in this plant-based world that we're in, we tend to focus, uh, not exclusively, but to a high degree on food. Um, and my approach within medicine is, I, I think of food as just one aspect of it. It's a hugely important aspect and one we absolutely need to get right. But we can't lose sight of all the other um, factors that go into uh, optimal health. And so what other disturbing trends are we seeing? Well, alcohol sales are going up. So people are turning to alcohol. Uh, online gambling, you know, uh, is on the rise. Um, there's concern that divorce rates, uh, we're going to see higher and higher divorce rates because um, couples are uh, sort of struggling to with all this time together um, when usually maybe one partner would where partners were able to go out to work or whatever, it had some space. Um, they're now seeing certain things come up that are, are causing divisiveness. Um, pornography. Pornography has just shot through the roof, um, you know, as, as high as 50, 60% increase. And this isn't just in the US, um, it's, it's all over the world. Um, drug use is increasing. Um, rates of anxiety, uh, depression are, are on the rise. Um, and so that's kind of at a, at a you know, societal level looking at these trends. Um, but I would say that even uh, as I you know, look to my patients on an individual level, um, I see a lot of discontentment and um, unease. Uh, you know, I, I uh, started a uh, Kaiser program um, uh, in Kaiser Santa Rosa uh, in the fall of 2019. And I've been working <clears throat> very closely with 13 uh, patients with diabetes and their uh, support partners. Um, and so I've been hearing kind of on the ground um, their various struggles um, these last few months with the shelter in place. And, and perhaps it's uh, due to fear of um, uh, loss of employment uh, or, um, you know, the stress of uh, being at home and surrounded by uh, food um, all the time and not, not being used to that. Um, and so giving into that. Uh, and uh, just yesterday, I was on a call with um, patients from CenturyLink. So the McDougall program, we work with CenturyLink uh, for the last few years. Um, and I was talking with alumni from the CenturyLink program um, and many of them are doing well, but, but a lot of them also are, are struggling um, with uh, this sort of increased time uh, on their hands that they, are, that they feel more confined. And so I was thinking about discontent and the ways that we cope uh, with the stressors of, of modern day life. You know, I mean, we could spend the entire session talking about why people are discontent, right? Um, whether it's the values of our, of our culture, um, whether it's the modern day, super fast paced environment that we're in where we're just running around like crazy um, all the time and, and don't have time to really attend to, to what matters most to us, uh, whether it's the lack of connection um, with, with others, uh, with ourselves. Um, 
But uh, what I thought is rather than kind of focus on the reasons, um, what can we do about it, right? Um, and I, I sort of see two patterns of how people deal with uh, discontent. You know, one pattern is that they numb out. You know, they just sort of want to, they, people want to escape. And so they, that, that's where you see things like pornography. That's where you see things like alcohol and drug use. And that's where you see things like food, right? Um, I, I know that there are people who doubt this, but I very much believe in emotional eating. I, I've seen it. I've witnessed it. In fact, I've witnessed it in my own life. <laughs> so people eat in ways that they would not otherwise due to very strong emotions. Um, and for many, that's an escape. It's a way of numbing the pain. Um, you know, so, so, you know, online gambling, all of those are ways, television, social media. Yeah. Those are all kind of ways of escaping, numbing out, not really dealing with the problem, um, at hand. Um, but the other way that I see people dealing with it is what I call striving. They, um, and this may be in work, uh, or, um, you know, trying to make more money, um, or, uh, you know, uh, be, they, people can strive in terms of physical activity. We all know physical ex exercise is important, but they almost let physical exercise be, you know, they start doing it three, four hours a day. Um, so they take some sort of healthy thing like work or making a living um, or, you know, exercising and they take it to the extreme degree, almost as if they, they need to prove themselves. Um, and, and so they just put pour all their attention in that, into that. Uh, and so either of those extremes I find to be, you know, um, alarming and concerning. And so what the one question that I would put to all of you, and, and this was the one question that I um, asked my patients at the Kaiser program at the beginning of the year, and that, that I told them is really what I'm going to be tracking on with them uh, from start to end, is... Uh, Basically, on a scale of one to 10, if you had to, to, to answer, how closely do your daily choices and actions and activities align with your most deeply held values and priorities, your, your best self, so to speak, you know, on a scale of one to 10? And your answer may, you know, be, will range, right? It can range as low as one or as, as high. I've never met someone where, well, there may be some people who say it's a 10, but in some ways, the people who say it's a 10, that, that's concerning because that's basically saying there's absolutely no area of my life that needs to improve. And so um, that's, that's another pro problem, which we call hubris. <laughs> um, and so I, I, you know, I want you to kind of, you know, I'll, I'll just pause for a second and really just kind of think about that, how closely do your daily actions and choices align with your, with your best self or with your most deeply held values and priorities? And what I would encourage you to do is think not just about food, all right? Because I wanna broaden this discussion beyond what we put on our plate, as important as that is. Um, I want you to kind of think about every single aspect of your life, your relationships, how much sleep you get, uh, how much you move your body, your thoughts, your emotional well-being, um, uh, you know, your spirituality, all of that. Um, so I'll just pause for 20 seconds and just, just reflect on that. Okay, and so, um, the other day I was working on a uh, survey that we're going to um, start giving to, you know, patients uh, who have come through the McDougal program who will be seeing us again or, or new patients. And um, I created like a, a lifestyle survey um, that looks at various areas of, of people's life. And so I'm just going to kind of read out to you some of these areas. And so you can just kind of start mentally thinking whatever you came up with just now, like, did you miss something or is there some, some area of your life that you left out? So the first is nutrition, right? You know, um, and basically the way I put this is 
uh, you know, strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. And the, you know, people would just circle this. So I eat a healthy whole food plant-based diet based on fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains the vast majority of the time. Right? And that's, you know, sort of the core of, of the, the plant-based movement. Uh, I avoid eating foods with added sugar. I eat minimal to no added oil or butter in my food. I limit my nut seed consumption to less than a handful per day. I don't drink sugar sweetened beverages, including soda and fruit juice. I limit eating out to no more than one to two times in any given week. I am pleased with my current weight. Okay. So that's, those are some of the questions dealing with nutrition. Uh, then I go to a series of questions around eating behavior. You know, um, I frequently turn to food when I experience strong emotions, such as anxiety, boredom, anger, stress, sadness. I frequently eat until the point that I feel stuffed and uncomfortable. Uh, I frequently feel guilty or ashamed about how much food or what type of food I find myself eating. I often find myself snacking even when I'm not hungry. I frequently snack after dinner. Um, I feel very self-conscious eating a McDougal diet around other people who do not eat similar. Right. Um, I, fr I frequently find myself eating unhealthy food in social situations in order not to quote rock the boat. Right? So those, that's, that's, those are some questions dealing with eating behavior. Um, how are your social relationships? Uh, I feel close with the members of my immediate household. Um, assuming you live with other people or if you live by yourself, I feel perfectly content living by myself. I have at least, this one's a big one. I have at least one or two very close friends or family members who truly know me, warts and everything, and love me for who I am, right? You don't have to put on your mask with them. You can actually let down your mask. We all have masks. Anyone who says they don't put on a mask is, a, in my mind, is a, is a liar, right? We all, we all have a mask to a certain degree that we, we put on. And with these people, you can really let down the mask. You know, I, what I try to help patients and what I work on in my own life is, is to increasingly let down my own mask and just be comfortable in who I am and, and to help my patients be the same. Um, but that is incredibly tricky in a world where we're constantly being judged and judging others, right? Um, in the current neighborhood I live, I experience a strong sense of community and belonging. I, if I am married or in a significant relationship, I feel like my partner loves me unconditionally and is very supportive of me. You know, how is your married life or how is your, uh, if, if you're not married, how is your significant other relationship? Is that, is, that, is that strong and intact? If I'm a parent, I feel close with my child or, or children. You know, I'm a father of two. Uh, Joshua is 12, Julia is eight. Um, they are the joys of my life. You know, we just celebrated Father's Day um and uh you know went to bodega bay and built this massive hole in the sand i brought my garden shovels yes i was crazy I, we brought three garden shovels and we literally just built this massive hole that we could sit in and um and then i read to them in there um and i've really had to you know there was a period where i was kind of um I, I don't think i was paying spending as much time as i really needed to be spending with them uh, and this COVID period has been a really nice opportunity for me to reassess and reprioritize. Um, and I actually consider fatherhood now, it is part of my job description that, you know, uh, it, it, <laughs> it is a very important part of my job description. It's not this sort of ancillary thing. Um, so I will absolutely make the time and be very intentional um, about that. But, but that, that's been a process. Um, I'm satisfied with my sexual life. Or if you're celibate I, or, and, and, and not sexually active, I'm, I'm satisfied with that. Um, movement, moving on to movement. In general, I incorporate at least 20 minutes of physical movement on a daily basis. Does not include walking that you may do as part of your job. Everyone wants to say, yeah, my job, I'm walking a lot. That's nice. That's good. But I, want, I just like the idea that people are very intentional about setting aside some amount of time, even 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day towards intentional movement. Um, <clears throat> yesterday I did a HIIT, high intensity interval training workout with my son. It was 20 minutes. It was at, we did around 5.30 and got it done and it felt great. Um, so it doesn't have to be anything fancy. 
you know, on a weekly basis, I get over 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity or greater than 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity physical activity or some combination thereof. And that's a recommendation, you know, that the American Heart Association makes. So it's, you know, it's good to just be aware of that. Um, this is an important one. My exercise regimen is not lopsided. It's a balance of cardiovascular slash endurance, strength training, balance, and flexibility. Um, you know, right now I have this image of Chef AJ doing the splits, you know, flexibility is clearly not, <laughs> not, not, not her issue, but she had to work at that. She couldn't, she couldn't always do that. Um, and so a lot of you out there are being really good about doing regular exercise, but here's what I see. Yes, I, I exercise every day. I go for a walk 20 minutes a day. That's outstanding. That's awesome. The only the only problem with that is that you could walk till, you know, from here to from the West Coast to the East Coast, you will have done absolutely nothing to build upper body strength. And so if you fell, let's say you're in your 60s, 70s, and you fell on an outstretched arm on your wrist, uh, there's a good chance you're going to fracture, right? Osteoporosis is a real issue in our country. Uh, so there's a great good chance that you're going to fracture because you're not spending the time to do things like push-ups. And if you can't do a push-up, things like push-ups on your knees, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I'm speaking as someone who had lopsided physical activity before. I ran the Boston Marathon um, in uh, 2000 uh, at 26.2 miles. And it was an incredible experience. But in my 30s, I realized that I can run a marathon, but I can't do a single pull-up. I cannot lift my body weight. And that seemed a little bit disturbing and lopsided to me. So the last five, 10 years, I've really made an effort to balance out my exercise. I have a pull-up bar at home um, and I don't even belong to a gym. So you do not need, resistance training does not involve joining a gym. Really, you can just do, use your own body weight to build up um, uh, upper and lower body strength, you know, squats, burpees. Um, now, um, you know, today I can do, you know, over 10 pull-ups, but in my thirties, my, you know, when I was 30 years old, I couldn't do a single pull up. Um, so, you know, it just shows you can, you can reinvent yourself. Right. Um, so think about that. And then flexibility is a real issue for me. So I've been spending time, you know, trying to, to work on stretching in hamstrings, calves, those are huge areas that get really tight. Um, and, uh, so I've been doing more yoga. So, you know, if right now you're someone who's exercising on a daily basis, but it's all walking or jogging or biking, think about how you can mix it up to, uh, to, to have it be more whole body. Um, I make every effort to spend some time outside in nature, at least once per week. There are so many studies talking about the benefits of nature, uh, for our emotional and mental well-being. Um, and you know, there's something about, just being out there, uh, having that space, having the beauty around you um, and the fresh air that is just so rejuvenating for the soul and for the mind. But not many of us are very intentional about taking the time to, to get out there, right? Um, and so uh, are you being intentional about it? Are you spending time in nature? And if not, is there a way that you could start to to actually make that part of your, your daily regimen. Um, overall, I feel physically fit. Do you feel physically fit? If not, what are you going to do about it? Do you want to feel physically fit? Uh, I can walk two miles without difficulty. That just seems like a simple litmus test, you know, and, and if, if not, is that something you want to work up to being able to do? Um, I can get up and down from a chair easily without using my hands. You know, like, can you get up? get down without using hands or do you have to kind of go like that and if you have to do that what that suggests is that your you know your um your quads your hips they're they're weak um and and that'll be important to build up and uh, as uh, if, if nothing else to avoid falls and improve your strength and balance uh moving on from movement purpose this is this is probably an area i've spent countless hours thinking about and, and um, reading books about. But we don't, we, again, it's not something we necessarily talk about a lot. Um, I feel that my life has a deep sense of purpose in me. Do you strongly agree with that? Do you strongly disagree? If you strongly disagree, you don't feel like he has purpose and meaning, then just think about it. You could be eating a 100% SOS 
it's no salt, oil, sugar, right? It's SOS free, whole food, plant-based diet, right? That's outstanding. But if your answer to the question of purpose and meaning is neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree, then that has strong thoughts, that has strong, uh, uh, what would I put it, um, implications for how you spend your time. I don't think you should be going to another plant-based conference or, or watching more webinars about the gut microbiome and how plants are going to help your gut microbiome. You're already doing it. That's your strength. I think instead you need to be reading books on finding purpose, you know, finding your true gifts and talents and, and how you can find a setting that really takes advantage of it. Um, right. That's your, that's your weakness. Uh, so, you know, give that some thought. I generally feel good about what I do on a daily basis, whether you're doing studies, whether you're jotting, you know, you're working, whether you're a full-time mother or father, uh, whether you're enjoying retired life, do you, do you wake up and feel a sense of purpose? You know, and a lot of this comes from, um, this isn't just Anthony Lim thought. I mean, this is well researched. This, you know, one book I highly recommend is The Blue Zones, written by Dan Buechner. Just absolutely groundbreaking, revolutionary book that there's nothing that's, uh, I mean, when everything that's in it is just like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And yet so few people incorporate all these principles. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, the Blue Zones are just these areas around the world that Dan Buechner visited and uh, interviewed uh, people where they have a high percentage of centenarians or people living past the age of 100. And so the five blue zones that he visited were um, uh, Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, Loma Linda, California, where there's a high number of Seventh-day Adventists, um, uh, the Nicoya Peninsula in, in uh, Costa Rica, and uh, Icaria, uh, Greece. And he interviewed over 260 centenarians from these five blue zones and looked at the things that they all shared in common and distilled it down to nine, what he called power principles. And, and you know, and it's things that you would guess, whole food, plant-based diet, daily movement, stress reduction. But one of them was purpose, you know, that people in these blue zones, they woke up in the morning and they felt a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, uh, that they were important, that they knew what they needed to do with their day. Um, and I will tell you that I meet a lot of patients who um, lack that. Uh, and they may be very busy in their work, but they don't find their work fulfilling. And, you know, it's funny because with these patients, we're spending more time talking about their job uh, and, and, their, and finding purpose than we are about plants which is always surprising to them because they come to McDougal or True North expecting that the thing that all I'm going to be talking to them about is plant-based nutrition. And, and for some people that I'm finding that's not their biggest issue, that there's, there's, there's other things that they need to focus their attention on. Um, if I'm currently employed, I find my work meaningful. Uh, if I'm currently employed, I do not feel like my work is unduly stressful. You know, maybe your work's meaningful, but it's, it's too stressful. You don't have any work-life balance. Um, so it's, again, it's too lopsided. You know, um, you can have too much of a good thing, right? Um, I am satisfied with the way that I spend my leisure time. There are some people that their identity is so based in their work that when you give them free time, they're like at a loss. They don't know what to do with it. And that's a little frightening because one day retirement will come. And what I view as something that ideally would be a joyous occasion sort of a rite of passage. I have gone from the working world to the retired world, and I, I get to fully enjoy the fruits of my, my effort um, and, and, and um, really invest time, attention, and energy into those things that, that matter to me outside of work. Instead, pe the, these people who their whole life was built around work, they are, they are at a loss. It's actually, it's, it's scary for them to be in retirement. They're bored. They might retire and then inevitably kind of go back to work. And so I think it's really important for people um, to, to find their interests outside of work and realize that they are more than what they do, right? Um, but that's, that's not easy in this sort of environment that 
bad values, productivity, efficiency, climbing the corporate ladder, reaching more people on Instagram, you know, having the most likes and, and all this. It's sort of this, you get caught up in this rat race that's never ending. And I see, you know, I mean, we're guilty of this in the plant-based world. I'm sorry. I mean, I've, I've seen it. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of this kind of striving. Um, so just because you've got 20 plant-based experts that are eating a perfectly healthy diet does not mean that all the rest of their areas are all, you know, beautiful. <laughs> we, we, we've all got issues. Um, religion or spirituality is very important to me. You know, and this, this again comes from the blue zones out of 263 centenarians. Uh, I think 259 of them all had some form of religion, worship, uh, you know, sense of something beyond themselves. Um, and, and it wasn't specific to any one religion. You know, in Okinawa, it was ancestor worship. In Loma Linda, it was Seventh-day Adventist. Sardinia, it's Catholicism, right? So it's not that it was specific to any one religion. You know, it could be Buddhist, Hindu, but it was just this idea of uh, something beyond ourselves. And, and the more I kind of see our individualistic, self-centered um, culture in the U.S., uh, you don't tell me what to do, you know, uh, uh, then I, I kind of start to appreciate the importance of this sense of something beyond the cult of myself. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, is, is that something that's important to you? Uh, if not, is that something that you want to, to explore or learn, learn more about? Um, in general, I feel content and at peace with my life. It's a pretty simple question, you know, wh wh where do you stand on that? Um, stress management is the next area. In general, I make it a point each day to rest and relax for some portion of the day. You know, I think um, one of the reasons why the Seventh-day Adventists are thought to be healthy is because of this idea of Sabbath, right? There's one day of the week, usually from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, I believe, or Saturday to Sunday sundown. Um, that they completely take off, they check out, you know, they're not checking email, they're not working. And what are they doing? They're cooking, they're out in nature walking, they're spending time with family. Um, so that's something I've recently implemented in my own life. Uh, usually uh, from Saturday uh, sundown to Sunday sundown, uh, I'm, I'm checked out, it's something I've done in the last year. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Christian, so uh, my faith is very important to me. Um, there's a lot of precedent in the Bible for um, just this idea of Sabbath. Um, and I, I can, uh, I'll absolutely love it. Um, it's my kids know that, you know, as hard as daddy's working, there's going to come that 24 hour period where he is just completely available, not just for 30 minutes, not just for an hour, but for 24 hours, you know, and I'm not like, uh, fanatical about it. You know, if I'm running a McDougal program and I need to work on Sunday, I need to work on Sunday. So it's not, it's, I'm not, uh, uh, you know, I'm not a sort of dogmatic about it, but I think just the idea of this cycle of work, rest, work, rest, not only on a weekly basis, but on a daily basis, you know, get up, do your work. I try to check out at 6 PM. So come dinner, I make every effort to shut down. I don't, I'm not always successful at it, but just having the intention makes a difference. Shut down so that the evening is dinner and you know playing with the kids and what, doing board games, and, you know, whatever, going out in the garden. Um, and so that it just kind of reinvigorates me for the next day, right? Um, I have stress reducing activities that I engage in that help me to cope with the daily challenges and stressors that I face. You know, a lot of people find meditation really helpful. Um, you know, for, for me, prayer is, is, uh, is what I, prayer and worship is, is what I turn to uh, for, you know, some yoga, uh, that, that's just a time for them to decompress. Uh, tai Chi, right? Um, stretching, just something that's kind of a quieting activity that allows them to, uh, to enter a, a, a space of deeper rest. Um, I have one or more hobbies that I enjoy doing in my free time. Uh, I'm not highly stressed out by my, by my finances. You know, financial health is, a, is an important thing. It's not that you need more, but you need to know that your needs are taken care of, right? And so, so either it means making more, but oftentimes what I find is that is, is needing less, right? Is, is kind of downsizing. Um, mental health, 
we're all, we're getting there. We're almost done. Mental health. Um, I, how's your mental health? Uh, do you feel nervous, anxious, or on edge most days of the week? Um, do you, uh, find it very difficult to relax? Um, can you easily become annoyed or irritable? Do you often feel afraid as if something awful might happen? Do you spend more than an hour a day watching or reading about current events? You know, that can be really detrimental. I, I don't think that it takes more than an hour to kind of understand what's going on with the day's events. So I think anything beyond that, it's kind of, it's, it's become excessive. And given that most of the news that we see this day is negative, imagine what kind of mental, uh, emotional toll that's going to have upon you if you are spending, if you're just glued in front of the television, watching, I don't care what it's CNN, Fox News, NBC, whatever. I don't care what it is, just sort of like mesmerized by what's going on in the world. Um, I often find that I have little interest or pleasure in doing things. I frequently feel down, depressed, or hopeless. I frequently feel fatigued and have low energy. I frequently feel bad about myself or that I'm a failure and let myself or my family down. Uh, my mental emotional state frequently makes it very difficult for me to function at work, home, or with other people. Mental health is a huge issue. It's very neglected. Um, you know, I've, I've been very open uh, in the last few years that I, it's been a struggle for me. Um, I, I have struggled with both anxiety and depression uh, in my life. Um, and so I feel this, you know, particular sense of compassion um, for uh, other people who struggle with this. And the thing, honestly, that has been the most helpful for me in dealing with, with both of these twin illnesses is being able to talk about it, you know, not, not feeling ashamed uh, about it uh, as if it's some hidden secret that I need to kind of keep carefully guarded. It's just being like, Hey, yeah, I, I, I'm not proud of it, but it is what it is. I've struggled with feelings of depression and worthlessness and insecurity and lack of self-worth. And it's been really hard. Um, but in the process of talking about it, in the process of kind of going to my source of comfort with these feelings of anxiety and depression, which for me has been in the area of faith, um, in, in the process of being open and, and, and letting my wife, Jean, who I've been uh, together with for 25 years, letting her more into this world of mine, I've experienced healing. It's not like it's disappeared. I still have my, my fears, but oh my gosh, I've come so far. Um, and it's not, it's not overnight. It's not a magic bullet. I've, I've had lots of therapy. Thank God for therapy. Uh, you know, I used to think that it was a... Um, it was a stigma or is some sort of mark against you if you ever had to go see a therapist. Now I'm just like, come on. I mean, if you slam your finger in a door and it's bleeding, you need stitches, you go to a doctor. Well, we have the equivalent of slamming our brain in the, in the door on a daily basis. And yet what's our mentality? Just suck it up, you know, and put on a, you know, put on a brave face and deal with it. And that, that's kind of the, that's kind of the mentality or the way that many people feel. And, and I, I think we've really missed the mark on that. So um, uh, I've, I've benefited so much from some of the recommendations that uh, my therapists over the year have made. And I, I haven't seen a therapist for probably over a year now, which is just to show like, hey, you know, sometimes it's certain seasons of your life and then you're kind of in a better place. So it happens that these last you know, over the last year, I've been in a much better place than I ever have been in the past. And, and so I'm not seeing someone now. But hey, if I go through another difficult period, sign me up. I have no, I have no shame about going to see someone for any, any uh, mental I issue that I'm, um, I'm grappling with. All right. So that's for all of you out there who struggle with depression and anxiety. You are not alone. Um, there are, I know many physicians, many businessmen, many board, many highly successful people who struggle deeply with um, depression, anxiety, or other mental health illnesses. Um, they're just not very open about it, you know, understandably so. I mean, there is still a lot of stigma around it, but we, we need to get over it. You know, we need to get over it. Um, sleep, how's your sleep? Do you get at least six to seven hours of sleep per night? Uh, when you wake up in the morning, do you feel well rested? Do you require caffeine to keep you awake and alert during the day? Uh, once you go to bed, do you fall asleep uh, easily? Um, do you go to bed and wake up at approximately the same time each day? 
do you generally need to take anything to help you fall asleep? You know, those are the kind of things that kind of get at, at um, uh, sleep health. And I tend to be probably one of the less dogmatic people within the plant-based movement. Um, I'm kind of the bad boy, you know, a little bit of the rebel. And I, 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 I don't consider myself a bad boy. I just am who I am. And um, something needs to make sense for me before I completely adopt it. So um, I know that there's a lot of like, you know, uh, sort of concerns about caffeine and all that. I think caffeine can be a problem, but I also think it can be fine. Um, I just had my cup of coffee this morning. Um, and the cup, I would absolutely stop that if I felt like number one, I was dependent on it. Um, that, that if you took that caffeine away, I'm going to become a monster. Then that to me suggests an unhealthy attachment. So that's number one. Or number two, if my sleep is disrupted as a result, you know, if, if, if because the half-life of caffeine is six to eight hours. So even the caffeine that you have in the morning, there's 25% of it probably coursing through your blood at night. So if someone's complaining of insomnia and having one or two cups of coffee in the morning, then my first thing is you got to get rid of the caffeine. In my case, sleep is not an issue. I sleep beautifully. I wake up feeling well rested. I've got great energy during the day. So I enjoy my, I enjoy my cup of coffee. Um, and uh, I'm not suggesting that those of you who aren't drinking coffee start drinking coffee. But you know, I will say that for those of you who are having one or two cups of coffee, as long as you're not dumping cream and sugar and stuff into it. I, Cause I think the biggest problem with coffee consumption is what people put in it to make it go down, you know? Um, but for, for my patients who are having a cup of black coffee um, or putting some plant-based milk in it and not having sleep issues, not dependent on it. If you took it away from them for a week, they're, they're, they're fine. I haven't seen the evidence that suggests that that's a, a major problem. Um, there, you know, Dr. McDougall and I did a whole webinar on, on coffee and tea, um, and I was not, uh, alarmed at what I saw. And I know what I'm saying goes against, um, what certain plant-based people, uh, would say that you absolutely, everyone who's drinking caffeine has to give it up now. Um, and I respect those opinions. I think it's important though, that you hear another opinion. And so then you, you're in a place to make a well-informed decision, um, for, for yourself. Um, and then last habits, you know, the obvious tobacco, uh, do you drink alcohol? And, um, and if you do, if, and if you do, uh, do you at least keep it below the, you know, two, two servings per day, if you're male or one serving per day, if you're female, we know more and more from studies that probably oh. any, any amount of alcohol, um, can increase one's risk of certain things like cancer, um, breast cancer, or prostate cancer. Um, uh, so, you know, again, I don't recommend for anyone who's not drinking alcohol to start drinking alcohol, but if you are drinking alcohol and you're not, it's not something you want to give up at a minimum, you want to make sure that you're within the, the recommended limits. Um, of course, recreational drug use, um, and then social media, right? Uh, do you spend excessive time on social media, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn? Um, I don't think social media is evil. Um, you know, I think that can be very healthy for connecting people, but um, I think that uh, it can also become an unhealthy addiction. And, um, uh, you know, people will, again, be looking just glued to their Facebook or glued to their uh, Instagram, looking at how many people have viewed it, how many likes they've gotten. Uh, and it sort of, uh, it kind of taps into our need for approval from others. Um, and more and more, I'm trying to get my patients to not need to not be so dependent on what other people think about them, you know, to start to kind of really come into who they are and to be comfortable within that, you know, um, whether people agree or, or not. Um, so that's a lot, right? I mean, when we're looking at health now, you can see, you know, plant-based, that was the first few questions, um, hugely important, but could you could you look at any area I talked about and say, oh, that's not important? No, I think all of those are important. And so when I look at my own life and I think about how well do my choices and activities align with my deepest held values, those are the kind of things I'm, I'm thinking about. I'm doing an entire life uh, survey. And, um, and so to kind of close, and then we'll kind of open it up for questions, uh, this could feel overwhelming. Right, because maybe all those areas I brought up, maybe you found yourself like, oh, that's not quite 
in check. Oh, that's not quite in check. Oh my God. Oh. And then by the end of this, you're just feeling like six feet under, like, oh my God, there's no hope. And that's not clearly, that's not my goal. But what I, what I want is a reality check. You know, it, it, it just starts with acknowledging the reality of, of our current life. Um, and then asking yourself, do I want to change? You know, that it, it's got to begin there. Do I want to change? Do I believe that I can, I can make an improvement? And do I want to? You've got to want to, and you, you have to believe in your ability to, right? Um, and and if, that, if you do want to make a change, then what I recommend is you start with one area. Don't try and address everything all at once. Just pick one area. Pick, pick the one area that you feel perhaps is the most problematic or the one area that you feel like you have the highest confidence that you can improve. And, and uh, the framework that I gave my patients um, is awareness. So start off with whatever that area is. Just begin with awareness. Don't try and change anything. Just observe your behavior in that area. Okay. So for example, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on myself. Um, I have in the past had a habit of stress eating. Um, and when it would arise is when literally you're looking at me sitting in my office. When I'm sitting in front of this, I'm looking at my iMac. When I'm sitting in front of this iMac and I'm trying to prepare a PowerPoint presentation for a talk I'm going to give, you know, at some conference and I'm staring at the same slide for 30 minutes, I feel incredible angst and distress inside. All these feelings of like, oh my gosh, you're such a, you know, you're such a failure. You can't even get one slide done in half an hour and it's really uncomfortable uh, and it's stressful because I've, you know, got other commitments and other obligations. And so what, what have I done in the past? I, I've eaten. Like, because I have all this nervous energy inside me. And so I would go to the fridge and then eat and then come back. And, and my patients would always laugh at me because I'd share this with them. And, and I wasn't necessarily eating unhealthy things. I was actually eating healthy things, right? Um, you know, this was when I went plant-based. I, was, I still had, I had this before when I, before I went plant-based in 2015 when I was eating unhealthy foods. But after I went plant-based, I still had this habit, but now I was eating healthy foods. So I might get carrots and hummus or an apple um, you know, or a piece of bread with peanut butter and banana or whatever. And so, and I wasn't overweight, right? I'm at, I've been between 140 to 145 ever since going plant-based BMI of 21 to 22 healthy weight. This snacking wasn't, wasn't causing me to gain weight. And so people would say, well, what's the problem? Well, the problem was that I was taking my stress and I was using it in my mind, an unhealthy coping tool. I don't, I want food to be either because I'm hungry or some sort of joyous celebratory event. I do not want food to be my crutch for when I'm feeling stressed and down and out. And so that was the reason I chose to do that. So first I just began with awareness, just noticing when I would go. And, and I really realized that I would go whenever I felt stuck and, and, and it just provided some sort of um, nervous energy release. Okay, so once you have an awareness of whatever the thing is, right, the next thing is intention, all right? So here's my awareness of where I currently am. Now, where do I want to go? Where, where do I want it to be? Um, and, and choosing some sort of realistic uh, intention that you actually feel you could achieve. Um, and so mine was pretty simple. <laughs> it's like, I want to stop going to the fridge and, and eating when I feel stressed out. I realize this isn't going to happen overnight. I realize it's probably going to hopefully just kind of go down in, in, in frequency, but you know, at its worst, I'm not exaggerating there. There would literally be in a single day, easily 15 to 20 times that I would go to the fridge to snack. I'm, I mean, I'm not exaggerating. And, and it was just this unconscious behavior of mine. Um, and, and in my ideal world, I wanted it to be, you know, maybe, at most five or six times, breakfast, lunch, dinner, you know, mid-morning snack, mid-afternoon snack, light post-dinner snack, at, its, at, at most. Uh, I would say currently, I'm generally about a four-time-a-day eater, you know, um, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and maybe some snack um, during the day, uh, and, and I'm pretty happy with that. But it took a while to get there, um, and stress eating is no longer a big issue for me. It's still there occasionally. Um, you know, I was a little, 
uh, anytime I'm going to do a webinar or some presentation, I'll always have a little bit of nervousness. So I was a little nervous for, uh, you know, being with, with Chef AJ on, uh, on this webinar, but I didn't go eat, you know, when I was working on this, this little scratch paper, I just sat down and I just, uh, you know, uh, worked this out and any nervousness I just, you know, I, I dealt with. Uh, and that's the key. You have to have some sort of replacement behavior, right? So um, I know that these feelings of stress and angst are still going to arise for me. And now that I've kind of cut off going to the fridge, what, I'm, what are you going to replace it with, right? You have to, because the same feelings are going to arise. You have to have some replacement. You can't just, you can white knuckle it for so long and say, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. But at a certain point, you know, it's, it's going to be overwhelming, like a dam that just breaks and the water's just going to come flooding through. And so it's much healthier if you can, can divert it somewhere else. That is an activity that is aligned with your deepest health values and priorities, right? The fact that I felt stressed during a presentation was not the problem. What was problematic for me was the way I was coping with it. And so, you know, everyone's going to choose a different activity. For some, it's going to be going for a run. You know, maybe that's more aligned with them and it gets rid of that energy. Uh, for others, um, maybe it's going to be calling their closest friend or their spouse um, or, you know, someone they trust and sort of saying, ah, I'm, I'm feeling the temptation, but I really, I really want to stay strong and kind of getting the feedback from someone they trust. Um, for me, it was pretty simple. It was prayer. You know, when, when I felt that strong emotion now, um, for me, I just, you know, I literally get on my knees and just say, Lord, like I am not strong enough in my own strength to resist these urges, but, but, you know, in your strength, I know I can do this. And, and so would you help me? Did it work every time? No, <laughs> it didn't. But how, did the frequency go down? Absolutely. And is it an issue that is even on my radar these days? No, it's not. Um, you know, it's, I'm not complacent about it. I know it's always there. Um, but that's the beauty of habits is that the longer you retrain that behavior, I mean, we know this from plant-based eating, right? You retrain your taste buds. Um, the longer you do that, the more that just becomes your way of life, your way of being. So whereas Anthony from six years ago was someone that if you had a video camera on me, you would have seen me go zip, 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 zip to the fridge back and forth. Now, if you had a camera on me, you would see me sitting in front of there getting stuck and then, you know, and then just, you know, like praying. And that is absolutely aligned with my deepest health values and priorities. You know, for me, my identity, I don't want it to be as a physician. I don't want it to be as a father. I don't want it to be as a husband. For me, my, uh, my identity is, is my faith and everything is a spoke from there. My role as a father, my role as a husband, my role as a physician, my role as a friend, all of that stems from my faith. But for each of you, it's going to be different, but you need to find that. You need to find your, the, the, the source of your identity and, and where you, you get that, that security from. Um, the last thing is that you got your awareness, you have your intention. Now you just got to take action. And when I think of action, I think of baby steps, right? Taking one small step at a time not trying to do it all at once. Um, and, and, then, and then after you take action is reflection. So you've got awareness, intention, action, reflection. And the reflection piece is, how did all that go? There was my intention, here was the action I take. How did that go? Did it work? Did it not work? What am I gonna do about it? And then boom, you go into your next iteration, right? And so it's this cycle. It's this cycle of uh, wh where am I at now? What is my new intention? How am I going to take action? How did that go? Based on how it went, how am I going to build that back in to this, you know, to this new awareness in this area of my life? And over time, you know, it's not overnight, but over time, um, if you kind of stick with this iterative cycle, uh, you will see um, improvement. And the most important thing, if I could wrap it all around with one word, this whole six cycle of behavioral change, it's self-compassion, all right? Because despite your best intentions uh, and despite your actions, you're gonna fall flat on your face. We all do. Anyone who says they don't fall flat on their face at times, again, they don't know themselves well. They're not willing to, to admit their, their inadequacies. And so what are you gonna do when you fall flat? Well, I'll tell you what some of my patients do. 
for them, that just confirms what a failure they are. Oh, I knew you couldn't do it. You're a total failure. You, you might as well just throw your hands up in the air. That's the inner critic talking. That just, you just want to like squash it. You know, it has no place. Instead, what I like to say is talk to yourself the way you would talk to your best friend. It's like, no, you know, AJ, that's okay, right? You know, we all, we all fall flat on our butt sometime. You know, just like, here, let's just get back up. Let's figure out what went wrong. Let's learn from this failure and let's reincorporate that into our next, next plan. And that has really been the sort of philosophy that I have, you know, especially with this Kaiser program over this year, that has been the number one thing that I have really tried to bring, you know, emphasize is that, hey, over the course of this year, we're all going to have our setbacks. I don't want there to be any sort of condemn, self-condemnation or judgment of the other person. I want us to be a very supportive community. I want us to be not only supportive of each other, but supportive of ourselves. Um, language matters. The words you use to talk to yourself absolutely matters. And so be mindful of that. Kind of start to have, it's called metacognition, right? Have this person outside of yourself that, you know, that's looking down on you and what your thoughts are and how you're behaving and, and just kind of distancing and, and, and sort of evaluating that. Is that healthy language or is that kind of toxic language? Because the messages that you're giving yourself will absolutely have a profound impact on your thoughts, actions, and behaviors going on from that point. And as someone who's suffered with depression and anxiety, trust me, if you could see the, the way I talked to myself in the past, um, it was harsh. It was really harsh. Uh, you know, it's, it was not pretty. Um, and I'm learning. I'm learning. It's not easy, and I'm, I'm still very far from it, but I'm learning how to talk to myself in a way that is far more loving um, and, and, and self-compassionate. So of all those things, awareness, intention, action, reflection, I would honestly say the self-compassion piece is absolutely the most important, absolutely the most important, because without that, I think any victory you have is, is short-lived, to be honest. Um, that's all I've got. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I, I, that, you know, I didn't know, I, AJ emailed me a couple of days ago, said, what, what do you want to title this? And I said, how about a conversation or whatever with Dr. Lim? Because I didn't know exactly what I wanted to talk about, but, um, you know, I thought about it and prayed about it. And this has really been the, the issue that I have seen become most um, prominent, not just on a societal level, but in my patients is this, it's just this idea of discontent, unease, dissatisfaction. And it's such a vague, abstract word. So my hope today was just to kind of put a little, give it a little more contours, specifics, uh, share a little openly about myself. So, you know, they can see sort of a living example of, of what it looks like to grapple um, with these issues um, and, and hopefully inspire you to just walk away from this and ask yourself this question. You know, in the er various areas of my life that Dr. Lim talked about, or, or even areas that he failed to mention, how closely do, does my, you know, video camera of my daily activities line up with, with my best self? And if it doesn't, what am I going to do about it? And hopefully with this framework I've shared with you, you can feel like you have some tangible tool to, to make some gains and progress in that uh, area. So... I mean, you're getting a standing ovation, but it's just that you can't see it. Uh, people, I don't know if you can see the comments, Dr. Lim, but people are so appreciating your message, your sharing, and, and just everything you said. And they're wondering if this is something that's written, like the, the test or the questionnaire. <laughs> uh, no, it's not. I'm, I mean, it's, again, these are all kind of the thoughts. I, I, I'm One of my goals, right? One of my goals is to get more into writing. Um, you know, I really... Uh, I've come to see the value of that as I read articles and books from Dr. McDougall from decades ago and just realizing what a gift, you know, that he's given us in putting his thoughts into writing um, and, and, and sharing that. And so, so my hope is to uh, start to write more articles. Um, Heather McDougall has asked me to start to write a few more articles for, for the McDougall program. Um, and, and, and that's a challenge for me. Uh, I'll openly share, writing is my insecurity. Um, I have never, I, I don't have a lot of confidence in my writing, um, and I need to address my fear. Um, I'm much more comfortable talking, uh, but I see the value of writing. Um, 
you know, and if, if, if we look at the pioneers in the plant-based movement, you know, Dr. McDougall always talk, talks about the, the pioneers whose shoulders he stands upon, you know, Pritikin, um, Kempner, all that. And he, he looks to their writings. That's what they left behind. Um, so, you know, stay tuned because, um, you know, this is, this is the area I want to move in and, and put, put some of these thoughts to paper. Um, I only came into this area in 2015, if you, or 2014, sorry. If you had met me in 2013, you would have seen me at in and out eating a double-double a uh, protein-style burger as I was, you know, paleo-ketogenic and thinking that, that oatmeal, potatoes, and bread were um, evil. <laughs> and uh, so it's really been since 2015 that, you know, I just kind of started really appreciating the importance of lifestyle and and nutrition and all that. And so I kind of viewed these first few years as just my, my learning, like just absorbing and assimilating. Um, and I'm starting to sense a shift to a different phase of my career, which is more the like, you know, writing and sharing. Um, but but I'm, I'm very much a person that likes to work at a pace that I feel comfortable with um, and not, uh, not overstretch myself. Um, so I try to practice what I preach. I, I, I can't tell my patients to try to have life balance and then, and then in my own world, just be running around like crazy, not having time to do this, that. But. Wow. Well, our mutual friend, Kathy Fisher, who's gonna be a guest on the show Friday is watching and she says, I would love to read a book by Dr. Lim on these topics or anything he writes. Oh. He is so articulate and caring. And that's uh, what everybody says, all just wonderful comments. Maybe you can see them afterwards or I could, I could take a screen. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to. Thank you, Kathy. I love Kathy. She's, she's uh, amazing. She, she's actually, she actually helped out with, um, uh, very much with the Kaiser uh, program. She did a couple cooking demos. Um, her uh, dishes were incredibly uh, popular and well-received. Many of my patients bought her cooking book. If any of you do not have her book, what is it? Straight up, what's it called? Straight up food. Yep. Straight up food. Get it. <laughs> it's beautiful. The recipes are amazing. Um, she has a real gift for, for uh, turning no SOS whole food plant-based food into just foods that make your mouth water. So thank you. And, you know, I have another one of your friends on the show next month who you introduced me to, Dr. Ben Brown. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's going to be that's going to be a treat for you all. Dr. Uh, Dr. Ben Brown was my uh, residency faculty teacher when when I came uh, 2010 to 2013 Santa Rosa Family Medicine Residency. Um, he he's uh, helped Dr. Ornish a lot with uh, his program. Um, and is, uh, you know, the head of the Integrative Medicine Fellowship along with Dr. Kohatsu at the Family Medicine Residency and just this fount of, of wisdom. Um, so he's, I consider him a close friend and mentor. Um, and uh, that's, that's one that you absolutely will not want to miss. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I want to respect your time. There's lots of questions, but it's, I think this is, it, maybe we could do that at another time. That sounds good. Yeah. This is absolutely. just such a beautiful presentation you gave and I want to leave this. That's what I want to keep, leave people with. Yeah. Well, thank you, AJ. This was a real uh, well, treat. No, thank you. And you know, I know this might sound silly, but people love to see the families of the guests. And I know your dad probably has a story to share. If he'd like to come on, I would love to meet him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, he uh, will uh, run it by and see. <laughs> well, this is what happened when I was interviewing Dr. Matt Letterman and he shared the story of helping his, his dad go plant-based and people said, well, I want to see the dad. And he gave me the email and his dad, who's also a physician came on and it was just wonderful. So please, please uh, ask him that for me if you don't mind. Okay. Let me see if my kids, maybe my kids can make an appearance. Oh, absolutely. The kids. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, yeah. one time we had family coming back. So we had a doctor on, she was actually doing, uh, when, when they not when they're not in True North forever, like like the training, like she she's a real medical doctor. She she did a rotation at True North, and she came on, and she's coming back next week with her kids. They're going to cook, so you you have an open invitation. Let, let me see if they're right outside. Sure, Joshua. And he has a oh. really cute dog. Oh, and, never uh, mind. They're 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 having their Chinese lesson with their grandma. And you, you have a very <laughs> cute dog, a white dog named Balto, right? Yes. Yes, Balto. He's been yes. with us many years. He's he's our, our canine yeah. companion. 
Just a fun question, if you don't mind, because people always want to know what you're eating, exercising. But I really like to know if you have time, what are you watching? Because I always like good Netflix recommendations from my guests. Oh, um, where, oh gosh, it's been a while since um, we've watched. Uh... <laughs> I know you used to watch Game of Thrones and that's what doc Dr. Furman watched that as well. I tried, I got through one episode and a half and I couldn't take it. It was too Oh long. yeah, no, I mean, get, the funny thing with Game of Thrones, the reason I'm having trouble scratching my head thinking about television is as I recognize that one of my uh, addictions can be television. So I joke, um, I joke with people. This, this goes back to my lesson on know thyself, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like all about all or nothing, but if you, you do have an area that is a weakness, then maybe you do have to be all or nothing. And so the, the joke is that one during residency, what is it, House of, House of Cards with Kevin Spacey? I remember I watched the first episode um, and, uh, you know, I thought I would end there. And then about eight hours later at 7 a.m., um, you know, after watching the entire first season, I was like, okay, that was not, that was not good. And I realized I, I learned about that aspect of myself that at least at this stage in my life, I can't, I can't handle these drama series. I can't like pace myself. I have to kind of watch them, you know, on a, a binge watch. And so uh, the funny story is when my friend Jimmy Wu gave me, uh, when I graduated from residency, he gave me the first two seasons of Game of Thrones and said, Anthony, watch this. It's going to be awesome. And um, I watched the first episode, the very first episode. And I said, I can't do this. This, this is going nowhere good. Like I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to be completely like useless to my wife and my family. Cause I'm just going to, I won't rest until I watch every episode in every season. And so literally I did what I had to do. I packed it back up and I took this set and I said, Jimmy, maybe when I retire, but you know, this, I, I can't handle it. And so that's why I encourage my patients to do like, Hey, I am not perfect. I eat things with added sugar, right? I have things with salt, but I will tell you that if I noticed that if I had a cookie uh, or a piece of dark chocolate, Chocolate, the next thing I know, the entire dark chocolate bar is gone, then that's a problem, right? So right now, if you gave me a piece of dark chocolate, I could savor it, I could enjoy it, and then I could stop there and I won't think about it again until I, you know, have my next piece. But for some people, that piece just sets off something in them where they don't know what happens, something comes over them, and the next thing they know, it's gone. I still remember a patient who saw me at True North who said, you know those Toblerone bars, not the small one, but the big ones? Yeah. The big ones, I eat those an entire one in a single day. And I'm like, okay. So in your kid, in the in these people's case, it perhaps moderation is not an option. And and that's okay. You know, you just gotta own it. So I'm not necessarily a fan of moderation is not an option in all areas. I'm really a fan of you figuring out what your hot buttons are and and if necessary, then to to create that black and white line for yourself that yeah moderation is not an option with game of thrones and for some people moderation is not an option with um uh with uh chocolate or sweets you know for alcoholics moderation is not an option with a glass of wine you know i am not perfect i uh i enjoy a glass of wine uh or two about once or twice a week especially on the weekends and um i'm perfectly content with that because i don't you know i don't go beyond that and um, and I enjoy it. Um, but if I started to notice that I wake up in the morning and the first thing I'm reaching for is a, is a beer, that's a problem. And, and I, have an, I have an alcohol issue. And then I just have to own it. Say, hey, uh, this is something I, I can't even, I can't even like have a, bit, a little bit. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, 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 oh, okay. You know what we've been watching? Disney Plus. So we subscribed to Disney Plus. That was one of the moves our family made. Uh, with the COVID. It's like $14.95 a month, maybe. It was the best decision we ever made. Like, they've got these amazing animal documentaries, whether it's like penguins or the last one my daughter watched that I watched with her mesmerized was on bears. So cool. Like, you know, they, and they, they managed to turn this documentary on these animals into, into like a story. 
you know, they'll follow like a mother and her cubs. And it's like so dramatic, but it's real. Like this is real nature that you're witnessing. I mean, Disney, wow, you got to hand it to them. They know how to make good good documentaries, good movies. Uh, I feel like it's pretty good quality programming. So um, that is something that we have been uh, watching a lot of, and I don't feel bad about it. I've been actually really uh, enjoying it. Um, there was a recent documentary on PBS on Asian Americans, uh, three, a three-part series. Um, so we haven't started watching that, but we're, we're, we're hoping um, to watch it. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's not, I'll check out Disney Plus. I haven't heard of it, but I love stories about animals. And I think you're right, Dr. Lim. People just have to know themselves because one person's chocolate is another person's Game of Thrones. So <laughs> exactly right. And it's a little more nuanced um, because what I find, what I find one of the traps that we fall into is that we want to take our rules and, as plant-based experts, and we basically just want to impose those rules on everyone. Uh, it's sort of like a, you know, just this applies to all people. And I, I just found that human nature is too complex. You know, there's general principles, right? There's principles of movement. There's principles of healthy plant-based eating. There's, there's principles of healthy connection. But the details and the specifics, um, I just find it much more effective when they are kind of individually worked out. And most important of all, when those changes come from the person within. Like, I never want, I never, ever want one of you to be saying, I'm doing this because Dr. Lim said so. That, then I have failed. I want it to be, you know, Dr. Lim made certain recommendations, brought up certain things for me to think about, and I have decided that I want to do X, Y, and Z. I have decided that it is in my best interest not to eat anything with added sugar. I have decided, you know, whatever it is, but it, it has to come from within. If it is just because Dr. Goldhammer or Dr. McDougall or Dr. Esselstyn or Dr. Graver, if it's just because they said so, that's going to last you this long before the next expert says something else and then you're going to jump to there. And that's why we see this problem. People just kind of flip-flopping and being all confused because they're not, they're not applying their own sort of internal knowledge of self and what makes sense to them to these, these recommendations. Um, and I, I really want my patients to, to increase their sense of self-efficacy, their, their sense of self-confidence, their, their knowledge of themselves, their belief in themselves, um, and then take expert opinions and sort of interweave that into all of that, as opposed to just like whatever this person says, whatever this expert says, I'm just going to do. That's a little, I, I find that dangerous. Um, so. That's just my own personal opinion. Well, people really thank you for sharing your time, your your soul, your expertise, and they would love you to come back with or without your dad. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that'll be fun. Thanks so much, AJ. This was no, fun. it's my pleasure. It was so wonderful catching up, and thank you so much for sharing from your heart. We really appreciate it, Dr. Lim. Absolutely. All right. God bless everyone.